There's no way, because we're just flesh, there's no way that even if you had that erroneous interpretation of holiness, holiness cannot, in that erroneous way, could never keep you clean and purified. Why? Because you're still living in an atom container and you're still a sinner and you sin every day and so do I. So there's no way to, to take that error and apply it in daily living. But what you can apply is you can say, God set me apart for his use. <laughs> Many of you remember a story I told years ago, I think I've repeated it, of a man who came to the cathedral when we were downtown. It was a man who had led a life of hatred and just had a terrible time. He was incarcerated at San Quentin and was saved in prison, and he began teaching other men, while he was inside, he, he liked to tell the story of the fact that he baptized people in the toilet. Remember that? <laughs> you know, they don't have access to a baptistry, so. When he was released, he began um, a halfway house ministry, helping the incarcerated, then released, to make their transition back into society. And I think when he started his program, it was, the idea was wonderful. Unfortunately, it got transformed into something where it was more for his personal gain, um, which is kind of tragic. And I've told you the story since then. Um, you know, he is, was promoted. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that there's a question that he once asked that it, it just always bothered me because he was actually a preacher. I think you'd call him a preacher. Um, but he came and asked the question the time that he visited at the cathedral. You're still, you're still teaching theology? <laughs> like, what on earth should I be teaching? How to shave your armpits? <laughs> but he made it sound like, well, because... The, I, I guess the emphasis was that all I do is, is teach doctrine, I mean, heavy. And he said, use the word heavy theology, because I guess all in his mind is I'm just teaching doctrine. But um, it's kind of interesting because when you really study the Bible, first of all, theology is theo, God, logi, God's word, the study of God's word, so that's number one. But when you really are studying God's word, um, you see a pattern, especially in the New Testament, that is probably the greatest teaching pattern laid out, especially within the writing of the Apostle Paul, which is a section of his writing, the bulk of it is doctrine, and then the last, sometimes last few chapters, sometimes the last chapter or two are practical application. Their exhortation to application. You cannot try and teach people by virtue of just saying, try this, apply this. There has to be a foundation laid. And we have these principles a a everywhere you look. I mean, I I'm going to use a terrible example because all of you are going to cringe when I say this. But if, you would, if you're a young person, you'd like to get a driver's license. That is the application of the learning how, supposedly, uh, to drive a motor vehicle. You are supposed to go through the, the doctrinal portion is, I guess, the learning, and then you're able to apply it. But you can't apply by, by, the, land, by the law of the land. You cannot apply before you have teaching. Although, I shouldn't use that. That's a very poor example, especially in the state of California. <laughs> but certainly, let's go to a better one. If you would like to fly a plane, you need to learn how to fly a plane before you can actually fly a plane. That, that is, we'll call it doctrine versus application. But you can't just say, you know, I don't need to learn that because I know how this works, so let me just get in the plane and fly. And the same thing is true about learning God's word. 
So you, this is what happens, and I'm saying something that's very simple but very true. You'll encounter a lot of ministries where if there is teaching being put out, it is not foundationally doctrine. It's this is what you do. This is what it looks like. It's a bunch of do-do. It's how to do. But the problem is that will never have any sticking or staying power because as long as you're not looking at what comes before, that is the whole setup to then understanding what exactly God desires of us through these inspired writers. That being said, I've tried to always um, make a combination of things, that is to lay out doctrine and then also to have some type of application so that we're able to walk away with something, take very tough theological concepts, reduce them down to a, a simple understanding, and then in the same message a lot of times have an ability to apply because I believe where you have to have something where the rubber meets the road. What good is it to just have this instruction and there's no real life application? So I think you can do both and I think over the years I've tried to do both. Um, and sometimes if you're listening to the network anyway, you're gonna hear uh, an incredible amount of teaching and some of it is laid out in such a way that you really won't be sure whether you're having the foundation, the doctrine, or the application because they almost mesh together. You don't have to separate them and do this and then this is the product. I think I'm saying this for a reason because a lot of the lessons that I would like to present end up in that fashion to where I would really love people to meditate on what I've said, think about, pray, go back and study, consider, because it is in that portion that things crystallize and they actually translate into your daily life. Not me saying, you need to go do this, but rather after your mind has been washed in the word after a while, you begin to see this is how things are applied. Not, I must apply them this way. They begin to be applied. It's almost like God's spirit helps us to naturally, it, it engrafts itself and then it comes out of us. So with that being said, I'm going to take us to a passage that I have um, referred to many times, but I want the, the focus of this passage to be slightly different than what I've done in times past. Um, if you'd like to follow along, which I hope you do, I'm going to be camping out a little bit in Romans 12 today. As I said, I've visited this passage quite often, and... Um, Sometimes I think, you know, we just jump right in, just go right into something. We have to be revisiting these passages on a regular basis, the necessity. A lot in between, but here we go. So Romans 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, let me stop right here and let me kind of say a few things. The first thing I want us to consider in this chapter, what I just read, is the therefore. Because the therefore, even in our King James, happens to be the most important piece of information to show you, and Paul's typically doing this repeatedly, therefore usually makes us stop and say we have to consider what came before. But in this case, because we're in the 12th chapter, using our English technique, because this is a letter, there was no chapter and verse when Paul wrote this, the therefore in this section is referring back to we'll call it a summary of 11 chapters past, first. Most importantly, what has just been said regarding Jews and Gentiles in the 9th, uh, 10th, and 11th chapters of this book. And this is what is so important. I have even been guilty of doing this in times past where I've jumped in and I've just used this Romans 12, 1 and 2, to go on and do my message. But the reality is quite timely because I've been dealing with some uh, conversations in my personal universe 
that happen to revolve around this. The therefore, in this case, if you go back to those chapters I've just referenced, uh, Paul's talking about the Gentiles who have been called, and he turns immediately to the Jews. So once he turns his heart towards, or his pen towards the Jews, he says, it's my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved. And essentially, he goes on to explain how God basically put, we'll call it the salvation of his chosen people on hold because they basically rejected the Savior. And he says, I'll come to that in a minute. Then turning to those people is about the 11th chapter. That's where he kind of gets into it. And he basically makes it very, very clear that referring to the um, verse 17, if you look 11, 17, so if some of the branches be broken off and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches. In other words, we, our time, the time of the Gentiles, was made possible by the people that God chose to be his own, rejecting, finally, God's plan was before they rejected, but ultimately and finally to say, okay, I'm going to put this time or this dispensation aside to deal with, with the rest of the world, which is the, the Gentile folks who hear and receive the gospel. And then I will turn again to the Jews. And this passage that Paul is speaking of specifically, you can go into the Old Testament and find abundant witness to what he's saying. He's not making this up. He himself was a Jew. But if you go into the books of Ezekiel, and if you look at Zechariah, there's abundant witness in the Old Testament to say the Jews will be brought in, lest people who have the, this is not my message right now, but I'll just say it, those people who have an erroneous idea that somehow the Jews have been pushed out and they're not included, that's a fallacy. That's not even scriptural. In fact, only Sorry, only ignorant people would make that statement. Not, it, not just ignorant of the Bible, but ignorant of what God in his infinite wisdom and mercy has done sovereignly to save whom he will. And we know that at the perfect time when God sent his only begotten son, it even says right there, and I've referenced it many times, he came to his own, his own received him not. In the opening of John, it says, but as many as received him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. But put that on hold for a minute because that is the dispensation happening now. Paul says in a future time, you know, don't think yourself so hot, so great. Don't boast. What we should be grateful for is that God turned from the Jews to the Gentiles and he'll return to the Jews again, but he did all of that in fact, 11 chapters worth of what God has done for us in Romans. Therefore, I beseech you, I don't order you, I don't demand. The word is parakaleo, which is more of a comforting term. I, I, would, I would like you to, I would hope that you do, I exhort you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Those mercies of God have been outlined in the 11 past chapters. And we talk about how people are saved, how salvation comes to man. We did not and cannot save ourselves. That's a mercy of God. Salvation has come first because God sent his only begotten son that we, by faith, might be saved. There's the first mercy of God, but you could, I could keep going and talk about God's love poured out in our hearts. That's the fifth chapter. Or how we overcome by yielding our members to God. That's the sixth chapter. And then the eighth chapter, we're told, there is therefore now no ultimate condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. All these are the mercies of God spelt out in this glorious book that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So let me stop there because I've got a lot to say as a form of kind of, I think, commentary. Let's start first with putting a header here. Let's talk about the worship of God. And 
these at times the things I have to say are they're unpleasant, but they're true. I find almost every time I go to present a message, there are there are concepts, biblical concepts, that whether or not I'm dealing directly with that subject, they will emerge anyway. And I'm going to give you the one that's right at the top of the list here from this passage, which is, if we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, does that say you are to present a shoe or a foot or a hand? The total me and the total you. So I'm going to ask you a question. It's rhetorical because I, I, I tend to address this periodically. How is it? This is not part of my message either, but it is a thought to tack on. How is it that people will argue about giving to God, time, money, whatever it is, they'll argue about this. They'll put up every argument. But what does my Bible say? You are to present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means all of me and all of you, not a part, not a portion. And I think if I'm presenting all of me, here's what it boils down to. You know how many times I'll hear people talk about what God is going to do for you? You know, that seems to be the popular preachment. What, what God, if you come, God will do this for you. Well, God's already done something by saving you sending his only begotten son, saving you and giving you the promise of life eternal, being with him eternally. But when you see ministries that keep talking about, this is what God's going to do for you, and this is, this is, today is going to be the best you of all the yous that have ever been because of what God is doing for you. But the only thing that I would argue against, I have no problem with telling you what God can do for you, but the problem is that God will do nothing for you if your attitude is, I'm only bringing a portion of myself. I only bring to the degree that I think God will even consider. Not considering that God sees it all because he made it all and it all belongs to him. I bring a portion. People that argue, I'm talking right now as a sidebar about giving, and they argue vehemently against either a tithing principle or a portion of giving, and, and their argument is that's Old Testament. Let me ask you, in the Old Testament, when people brought an animal to be sacrificed, as was prescribed in the law, there was indeed the concept of transferring guilt by the laying on of hands, transferring of the guilt, transferring of the human portion, if you will, onto the animal that was to be sacrificed. However, it was symbolic of what it was supposed to mean to the individual doing it. In other words, the missing ingredient is it wasn't just bringing that, okay, that animal has now been slaughtered so I can walk away and never think of it again. It was supposed to be an actual act, but in symbolism, what we now say in the New Testament, to walk in newness of life, to be, we're made clean in the New Testament through his word, by his blood. But there, there was a representation that occurred. So when we talk about people saying, well, this re represents the law, or this, this is not a good thing, or I won't do this, or why, why should I do this? You know what that tells me? That individual has not yielded themselves and you can, you can get mad at me all you want, and you can sit there and, sh you know, hmm. that is an unyielded spirit of an individual that would still be balking at, let's, let's talk about this. I'm going to find one hair that I can split with you so that we can argue over the greatness of my salvation and what the Lord has done and all that I supposedly belong to him. We're going to find this one fine hair that we can now parse and divide and be divided over because I'm going to argue my case on one piece of hair. And that's what these people do because they do not want to face the fact that an unyielded spirit, unyielded will never be full of love, Unyielded spirit will never have a giving spirit. I've met people who think 
Sorry, I'm not their judge, but I can tell you one thing. Somebody who has yielded themselves to God, what happens to you, you whether you want to admit it or not, because you might be just like me, and I don't want to admit it, but it's the truth. God starts changing your whole outlook on everything you see around you. And suddenly, as I've said, even the one that I mentioned at the beginning of my message, who had a very hard heart filled with hatred, he was a part of the Aryan Brotherhood, and began to preach the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about this, this is very important. The idea of presenting your body as a living sacrifice. I don't want it to be thought of as poetry. In fact, this section should begin application, but there's still doctrine in here. In fact, here they're actually bound together. Because without yielding to God, completely. That doesn't mean you go and lock yourself in a convent somewhere in a monastery. Yielding yourself is the first, we'll call it the first place of the worship of God. Because our nature is such, and this is, what I'm saying is true and it's harsh and it's brutal because we all, starting with me, we all face the same problem. I'd love to say worship God fully, wholly, yielded, but the fact of the matter is the flesh kicks in. And before you know it, you're back to doing a little bit of self-worship. Am I saying the truth? Absolutely. That, that's a description of all of us. So there is something really uh, wonderful if you look at this presenting yourself. And the presenting of yourself, presenting of your body as a living sacrifice, says you're not to go... This is a subtle thing. You're not to go on the altar and die. What good are you to God that way? But die to self. Big difference. And you notice he doesn't say present yourself a dead sacrifice. He says a living sacrifice. Alive and able to yield worship back to God. And this is why I first mentioned the subject of giving. Because too much of what happens in Christendom is I want, give me, what can I get? It's all of this, and still, that's still motivated by greed. Listen, I'd love to say, and I'm sure I could fill this church a few, couple of times on a Sunday morning if I change the message just a little bit to say what you can reap the benefits of. This is what you'll get. But the fact of the matter is, if God didn't do anything else for me in my lifetime, he's done the magnitude of what he has already done in choosing me out from among those he didn't choose, and I'm speaking about you and me when I say that, saving me, opening my eyes, letting my ears be open so I can actually hear and receive, letting the word sink in, and sometimes repeatedly I have to hear it again and again and again and again, right? So the presenting of self is not that much if you think about it. And let's talk about this because this is where I, I sat and I could not get the thought out of my head. I tried to move on and I kept coming back to the same thought. You will either present your body as a living sacrifice or you won't. But at some, at some point you will be presented before God. So you have the choice. I know that sounds really terrible, but you have the choice right now. I'm not talking about today, like some evangelist saying, right now, today, you can decide. God can do that for you right now. I can't, and neither can you. God can do that for you right now. But you have the choice of being real, and the real choice is this. You're either going to present yourself a living sacrifice, eventually you will be presented. And I don't know what the concept will be there, but I'm talking about eventually is your lifetime. Eventually that's going to happen. Or some, somehow people are surprised when they say, you know, you talk about this a lot because it's an absolute, you can, we can talk about things, we're going to argue about politics and um, 
green things and not green things and whatever, but there's one thing that you are not going to argue with me, you're not going to win the argument. And that is even in our lifetime, if they perfected a way to give you 20 more years or 30 more, this thing's going to wear out eventually. It's, it, because of Adam and Eve, it's not meant to stay here. So you're either going to present yourself now. Romans 6 talks about that. If you yield yourself to whom ye you yield yourself, you become a member of. Yield yourself unto God, you become, and I said this before, it sounds funny, but you become a tool for God. You become a tool of righteousness for him. Unyielded, you become a tool or a pawn, if you will, specifically and automatically for the flesh, and quite frankly, probably the devil as well. So when we look at this, it's important. And then it, he goes on, Paul goes on to say, holy, acceptable unto God. And my focus actually starts with that word acceptable, but let me touch on holy because I know there are folks listening who don't have a lot of teaching background on this. And when we think of holy or holiness, we think of... <laughs> that type, we're not talking about that type of holy, right? Nor are we thinking about... this type of holy either, okay? <laughs> We're talking about something that is, remember, hagios, completely set aside or set apart for the use of the deity. That's what holiness means. Holiness does not mean, as some people think, cleansed and purified and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so clean that that's such a... wish I could really tell you what I think that is. It's pretty messed up because... There's no way, because we're just flesh, there's no way that even if you had that erroneous interpretation of holiness, holiness cannot, in that erroneous way, could never keep you clean and purified. Why? Because you're still living in an atom container and you're still a sinner and you sin every day and so do I. So there's no way to, to take that error and apply it in daily living. But what you can apply is you can say, God set me apart for his use. That's an important statement right there because it says God set you apart for his use. And not everybody is called to the same. That means you go to the office, you may be doing a job in the office, but God has his hand on you for his use, set apart for him. It may be simply because he knows that you're able to... Um, Sit down, you may not be a good speaker, but you're able to talk to him, set apart for him. But it's all set apart for him. It's for his purpose. It's to bring glory to him. So when we talk about holy, set apart, a living sacrifice, set apart for him. Well, if it's set apart for him, what does that mean for me? And this is the oldest argument for people who are scared to open their mind to what God is really saying. Set apart is not set apart for him so that I don't have a life anymore. See, I always thought from being a young teenager until into my 30s, if I look back, my understanding, if I were to take this concept, would have been set apart means I no longer have a life. Because if I'm only living for him, then I don't have anything else. But the reality is it's the complete reverse. As I come to discover what living for him means, I discover the life he designed for me that is more, it's greater than the life that I envisioned. And I know this to be true because I look back at the first half of my years on earth and recognize that that couldn't have been his design that I was living in. I was living in my idea of what I thought his design for me was. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> when you are living unto him, you suddenly uncover or you discover because God takes away the covering from your eyes, his true intention for you. And it is not that you may be locked away somewhere and you have no life and I can't read. You know, I'm, I, I can't take this life of just being in this little box. It's not about that. 
That's the flesh mind that is at enmity against the spiritual. So living, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And what is this word acceptable? Because you're going to see it repeatedly here. Acceptable unto God. And then if you read down the second verse, it says that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This word, we'd be better off looking at it as well-pleasing to God, not just acceptable. Acceptable means you did this thing and God says, yeah, okay, I'll accept that. <laughs> really? But well-pleasing. Let me, let me give you an example of that. Um, sometimes I like to spin around and show you some passages where you encounter a word, the exact word, in fact. Um, for example, in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9 where Paul says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. No, that we may essentially please him or be well-pleasing to him. Or how about this? I know you're, some of you haven't turned with me, and that's okay because I'll, I'll turn for you and I'll read them to you. Uh, out of Ephesians, you've got the same concept there. Um, in the fifth chapter, in the tenth verse, you go back just a little bit where he says you were sometimes eighth verse darkness, but now are ye light in the, in the world, walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the spirit, really actually the fruit of the light is the real word, is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. No, proving what is well pleasing unto the Lord, what pleases him. The clearest one of these examples is out of Hebrews. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And it's the same Greek word. So when, you, when you're reading this, it's important to see that um, it is, the concept here is to please, to be pleasing. So present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, that is well-pleasing unto him. What pleases God, I just said, faith. And presenting yourself a living sacrifice is not presenting yourself as, look, God, I finally... I washed, I cleaned, I did all of this. That's, and God says, hey, don't, don't even go there. A living sacrifice, that which is set apart for him, well-pleasing unto him, which is your reasonable service. That Greek word for reasonable is where we get our word for logic. It's, your, it's the logical thing to do. I know that sounds a little weird. That's why I brought my 26th translation with me so I could read that to you. Um, because there's a little bit of, um, a few of these translations, which is your reasonable service, spiritual service, rational service, reasonable worship, spiritual worship, as an act of intelligent worship. Uh, this is the worship due from you as rational creatures, sometimes, <laughs> which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. And that's why I started this section by saying the worship of God. Tell me, what do you think worship is? Does worship only consist of uh, I sing praises and I pray? Because that's a very small outlook on the total picture. But what if the idea of worship consisted of desiring to please and not with measured acts of works and diversities of things that could never gain any favor. Here, Lord, I'm here. You've heard me tell the story, and I've said it in different ways. You know, there's songs written about this in the old hymnals, you know, use me, Lord. And I really think that sometimes people come into ministry, whether it's in the pew or in the pulpit, that's in their heart. Lord, use me. I want to be used by you. And then suddenly, when God turns his attention to, okay, I heard that. You don't have to say it twice. But when the real application begins, there isn't a desire to say, Lord, all I want to do is please you. It's the pressure is too hard. It's too great. I can't do this thing. That's, our, that's the flesh that caves in versus if I desire to be used of the Lord, the only thing I have said this to you before, 
you can take away everything. There's one thing that I'm going to live for as long as I have breath in my lungs, and that's to be well-pleasing to him. There's a lot of people that are going to hate, they're going to love, they're going to destroy, they're going to try and do things, but as long as the audience of one there looking down says, you know, that one there has been a tough nut difficult to work with at times, a little nutty, sometimes a little this or a little that, but in the heart, because God sees the heart. She just wants to please me. God sees that. It's not substituting, well, here are my good intentions, Lord. I meant really good by this, but what's in the heart? I desired to please you, Lord, and I know I can say this, I will say this at the front of the line, and I know I've failed you, Lord. Not just once, but many times over. You know, that's when I think God, I think that's when God goes, I'm paying attention, really, really paying attention. Not that he doesn't pay attention at other times. But when we can honestly say, this is in my heart, but I fail miserably. This is what the Apostle Paul was saying in the seventh chapter of Romans regarding the things he desires to do, but he finds himself not doing. What do you think that means? Some have made different interpretations. All I can tell you is we start off in this mindset. And as long as that mindset remains, because a lot of things are going to change in your walk. A lot of things are going to change from the rosiness and the wonder of coming into the church for the first time and everything seems great, right? You sing the songs, you, you learn the songs of the church and then you walk around, sing them. You're happy, right? You're so happy. And then the first storm of life hits you. It hit, doesn't hit the fan. It hits you. And suddenly you, that little rosy thing that you had going on, it's not so rosy. But you overcome that, right? And, you know, you just keep going. You keep walking. Here comes another one. And after a while, it can kind of lose its glow. So it's important for us to kind of look at all this and understand the worship of God. I'm going to worship you when the sun is shining and when the rain is falling. I'm going to worship you when I'm in good and perfect health, and I'm going to worship you on my deathbed. I'm going to give you praise, Lord, that you gave me breath in my lungs and you gave me the ability. You called me. You ever feel like that? Like you wake up in the morning and you just say, you called me, Lord. Of all the people that you could have called, you called me. Do you even realize what you've done? <laughs> <laughs> but this is part of when I say the worship of presenting the self, the total being. And at least be this, be honest with God. I just stood in front of you and said it. Desire to please, but Lord, I know I've failed you many times over. But the desire is still there, Lord. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and I'm going to reread this. Why? Because in this, is, in this next section is the wisdom of God. We, we're looking at the worship to present ourselves. Here's the wisdom of God coming through the pen of the Apostle Paul. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Let's stop right there for a minute. As I've done this before, but for those who don't have the notes in their Bible, that be not conformed. Let's see here. I'm going to write out the Greek for you. You don't have to learn this, but I'll just point something out, and you can see it as plain as day. Why am I doing this? Because the New Testament was written in Greek. Now take a look at this. <clears throat> this is the prefix which we would sue, but soon we get our words, our cognates, our prefixes of um, like symphony, something that is with or together. But take a look at this. So I'm going to write it out phonetically. In English, hopefully I'll stay in English. Ski, schema, the, zes, the. But you can see scheme, schema, the scheme. Do not be conformed. Do not 
succumb to, do not get drafted into the scheme of the world. And Paul uses this in another place regarding the methods of the devil. Same word is being used. So be not conformed to this age, as your King James say, to this world, but be transformed. This is one of my favorite words. Metamorphuste. From our English word for metamorphosis. Do not be conformed. Don't go along with the schemes. The schemes of the world say, oh my goodness, do you even realize if you presented yourself a living sacrifice, you're not going to have, that's what the world says, you're not going to have a life. Why does the church need you? Ask not what the church can do for you. <laughs> but the mindset is bent towards this. And it's most unfortunate because, and this is what I love about the Apostle Paul, especially because of this wonderful Greek language. The schemes of the world. Get what you can get now before it's too late. Take everything that you can. Do not give. Be as mean and as callous as you can because if you don't, somebody else is going to come and give it to you, right? The world says that. I've had many discussions with people that say, oh, I just don't get the Jesus saying, turn the other cheek thing. As somebody's always telling me about it. Well, what's the deal with Jesus? Turn the other cheek. Now, it makes him sound weak. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, you know, I think there was, first of all, that's always text out of context, by the way. Consider the passage that he says that in. But also consider something that eventually, at the end of everything, and I always say this, you may be the person who has been the most wronged that you think has ever lived beyond Job. You are the most wronged person in the world. Well, friend, present yourself a living sacrifice. God's going to take care of you. And he's going to take care of you. You may not see it in the now, but believe me, he's going to take care of you in the later because all the people that wronged you, they're going to be to the left, right? <laughs> so I just think, you know, you, 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 if you look at what's here, it's brilliant. We have the wisdom of God saying don't, through for the Apostle Paul, don't be transformed. And by the way, if I may say this word for transformed is in the passive, which means a lot of times we don't have to be um, schematized, if you will, to the world in an active way. Like, I'm going to go out and do that. Okay, I'm going to give you a really silly example of something. Again, it's one of these things where you go, wow. You know, if you watch enough television, and I'm not saying TV is bad, I think TV is really great. There's some really great stuff on TV. <laughs> but I, I urge you to pay attention to something. I'm not one of these people that says, don't, don't watch that because that's, that's blasphemy or that's about, listen, everything around us, it has some warped message one way or another, okay? So I'm not the type of person that says, don't expose yourself to that because it's going to contaminate you. What I am saying is that we're savvy enough to know you turn on the TV, most of the programs are being written by people who mm, are not into reading much of this book. So you're being fed a lot of things to digest that eventually if you get exposed to them enough and they, are keep, they keep putting it back out on you and it's, it's just repackaged in another format and gets, eventually it becomes like you have been numbed by it. There's no, there's no effect. There's no impact. It just becomes, oh, okay. And basically, I'm not saying don't watch, don't look, because that breeds ignorance as well. I'm simply saying that a lot of times when we take these passages, we can say, oh, well, that's, that is an old-fashioned way of thinking. No, it's actually the problem with today. Because you can be exposed to all of that, but here is the wisdom of God between being conformed in a passive way where you're 
you're being exposed to it or being transformed, which is ongoing, being metamorphosized in an ongoing way by what? The renewing of your mind. You can be exposed to stuff all day long. At the end of the day, the renewing of your mind is what's going to keep things straight and in order. And somebody says, oh, you shouldn't look at that or you shouldn't go there. Well, okay, what, what would you like me to not do? Because everything is poisonous and everything has toxins and everything is bad for you. Where would you like me to stand still so I can have a life? That'll, that'll hit you later because the fact of the matter is you can't. So the renewing of your mind, and I love this word from the Greek. I love this word because it really speaks volumes to me. The word is ana kenosai. Ana from above and keno from new. So the renewing of our mind does not come by me saying, I'm going to think good thoughts, I'm going to think clean thoughts. It comes from above. And this word without the prefix ana attached, is the same place where we get the new creature, new creation, Galatians 6, 2 Corinthians 5, those passages that talk about the new man, or even keno at its root, the word keno, where Christ says this is the blood of the new covenant. So all things that are new that come from above, by the renewing of your mind, as I said, this is the wisdom of God, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, there it is again, and perfect will of God, which brings me to the will of God. So the worship of God, the wisdom of God, and now the will of God. And what, what I can say about this, where it says that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, it's poorly translated into the English. So if I were to pick apart by words simply, I would say to you, you have in the order that they appear in the Greek, uh, to prove is not the word we've looked at before, that is, where God tests our heart. This is like a metallurgist, if you will. It's a different type of testing, dokimezain. To prove what is the will of God. And then the Greek says agathon, good, eureston, well-pleasing, and teleon, perfect. What is the good, well-pleasing, and when it says perfect, think more along the lines of complete, completion for you, will of God. Now, all you got to do is step back from this and you start hearing people talk about or arguing about things like, well, I can't, I can't give to the church or I can't give of my time or I can't, I, 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 right? And you realize that that has to be an unyielded mouth that's going because a yielded heart is reading this passage and saying, wait a minute, I want to be, the word acceptable, I want to be well-pleasing in his will. I want to be, his will is that which is good, acceptable, and perfect, or that which is going to be complete, or the completed will of God. I have yet to meet somebody who's made all the arguments against the church, against giving, against giving of oneself, against all of these things, that they'll actually kind of, when they're done arguing, say, and I want to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I, if I'm going to act in faith and I'm acting on what this word says, there are a few things that come to the forefront. The first thing is what the will of God is for me. And I go back to that word metamorphosed. Not I change myself, not I work on me. That's, that's the world saying self-improvement. I'm not suggesting self-improvement's not good because we can always do some self things. But when it comes to the things of God, it's God doing the changing. This word, by the way, is the same word, the metamorphosed, the transformed, the what is transformed in the King James is the same word that appears when Christ is being uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he's changed. It's the same word that's being used. God desires to do that to us. And it's a simple act. And as I've said many times over, if you just line this up, the dedication that God is looking for is not half and half. It's not just a little bit. It's not, it's not well, I'll, 
I'll put a little bit of lint into the offering. I'll put a little bit of myself today because you know, I feel like maybe if I do that, things will get better in my life. It's not about that. That's still in the what God can do for you camp versus what can I give God? Because the reality is, if I had all the money in the world, if I had every good gift, all of that would still not be enough to express my gratitude at, as to what the Lord has done for me. Does anybody here want to disagree? If you believe in heaven, if you believe in hell, if you believe in Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh, if any of this is real, there's no amount of money, there's no amount of things, but in the big picture, God says, I desire to know. Much like Abraham, complete obedience to offer up Isaac, knowing the Lord would provide. Was Abraham always obedient to God? No. This is why I say, if you're really reading the Bible, you see we're just like them. We're just like the people in the Bible. Not always, well, God said, I got to walk this, in this path over here, and not, not, go, not go over here, not go over here. I got to walk over here, so I'm just going to walk in this little narrow lane. Find me someone that did that. Even for a little while, Job deviated. Even for a little while, and we don't know the timeline, David deviated a couple of times. <laughs> Moses deviated. Find someone in this book that didn't deviate. And I'm, I'm strictly speaking of those that we, we tend to put them in the whitewash category, and somehow they're not like us. We are just like them. So you are to present yourselves. Learning from, gleaning from these and they are great, uh, if, we, if we're really looking, to have what I would call a mental revolution done by God. That instead of looking at and, and counting on, as I said, the splitting of hairs, and we're, we're going to, let's, come on, you and me, Barbara, we're going to fight it out. We're going we're to talk about uh, uh, some heavy theology now, and you disagree with me, let's, come on, come on, let's get in the ring and let's battle it out, right? Brilliant. That's really yielding oneself to the Lord. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clock Barbara in about two seconds, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll, I will have had a victory for the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Tell me what type of craziness that is, but rather yielding of the complete person a living sacrifice. I'm alive, Lord. Use me. And not just use me, but I'm yours. And everything that comes along with me, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it all is yours. You made it. You own it. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what I really want you to walk away with today, and this is probably the, the, at the key of everything, as I talked about worship wisdom and will of God, but the most important thing underneath it all is when we talk about the yielded person. And this becomes important because unyielded, you can still be going through the motions, you can still be going through what I call, and a lot of people do that, they go through the motions of Christendom and Christianity, but unyielded, they're, they're, they're still arguing, they're st and that's not that's not to say that God's not going to keep working on you, because I believe he will, and eventually one of you is going down, and it's not God. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to say to you is that there is a beauty in reading Scripture and meditating and thinking about. I'm not to, I'm not to pick apart and try and analyze. I'm going to analyze everything about me in minute detail to figure out, am I, am I doing this right? Or just a yielded person says, Lord, and if, if I'm not, Lord, show me, because I can't microanalyze myself, but you know me. You know my heart. Help me. And if it is that the problem is I still haven't yielded to you, and I think we, we all do this. We have, the, it's, it's this, it's a roller coaster. There are moments when, tell me if, if this is not you, because I know it's me, and I think we're a lot alike. I think, I think we're exactly alike. I think we have times where we are, oh, I am just filled with love and gratitude and devotion to God, and 
here I am and I'm, I'm sitting on the edge of my bed and I'm praising God and all I want to do is talk to him. And, I'm, and then I have other times where it's on the low side, where it's like, you know, what? <laughs> Does that sound familiar just a little bit? Because I know it's true for me. And I think we all suffer the same thing, which is why you always need to come back to this in the renewing of your mind. And it is in listening to the word of God that opens up and refreshes and renews. It is in hearing the word of God that faith comes. It is in opening up that yielding to the word of God, not to the preacher. This, this is the voice that's speaking the words, but to God's word and unto him. To recognize, I, Lord, I've, I'm, I've yielded myself a couple of times already, <laughs> right? Lord, help me. I need to have a little more sticking power, and I can't do it without you. And the yieldedness that you require is the battle between flesh and spirit. Lord, increase my faith. Help me to be a little bit more attuned to your guidance, because that's the other thing. God gives us the guidance when we are in the word to renew our mind, to kind of set us back on course. And with all of that being said, a new birth of dedication that comes, a new, if you call it, a new wave of dedication that comes once more. And if it takes what we'll call cyclical patterns, then you can look back and say, Lord, I know you helped me before. I need help again. Not, Lord, I'm only coming to you because of what I can get and what I need. Lord, I'm here because I need to give. And I'm going to start with myself again today. I'm starting all over again. Here I am presenting myself to you, Lord. If you'll take this miserable container, I'm going to yield it to you. And I may, I'm being honest, Lord. He, know, he knows our thoughts. I'm being honest with you, Lord. I, I may not stay on the altar too long but it's in my heart to please you. I need your help to be dedicated in this way, and I know you can do the transformation. You're still working on me. Thank God you haven't given up. And I'd say if I've spoken anything today, it's something for you and for me to think about, and thank God that we can, we can be here today and say praise God for the transformation, although it is not a transformation that goes linear just in one direction, has its ups and downs, so we're able to look back and say, yes, the Lord was leading me. Now I'm back here, but Lord, help me up again because I desire to be that for you. I desire to please you. That's in my heart. I pray it's in yours as well. I hope this message helps somebody today in their battle, in the unyieldingness of your heart to dedicate once more. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.